Hello my wonderful nerds and welcome back for another video where we will get lost in the biological conundrum that is the inheritance of magic. This video was requested by Rayhan who lamented about the tangled web he got himself tied up in just trying to justify a world where magic can be inherited. And I will admit this wasn't something I had thought about much before he mentioned it but boy, did I get lost down this rabbit hole a bit after he did. But do not be afraid because I'm at the other side and I have some very interesting insights to share with you that I gathered on the way. So what is so confusing about the concept of magic being inherited? I hear nobody asking because if I did, then there would be someone in the house, which there isn't. So Gandalf would be worried about me if I was hearing voices. Well, it's a conundrum because of how evolution works. If something can evolve and confers an evolutionary advantage once it has evolved, then why would it only have arisen in a recent enough point in history for only humans or whatever the dominant race in your world to have it? Highly beneficial abilities are even known to have evolved on multiple occasions over the years. We see this with the eyes in a process known as convergent evolution, i.e. when the same end product, eyes, evolve through different means from different species, but produce the same end ability, sight. In the case of eyes, you know, a great example is the octopus eyes versus pretty much every other species out there. But the same is true for birds and bats when it comes to wings. Both have them, but they evolved them through two very different processes. This happened because flight was so useful and mostly magic would be useful. So why don't we see it arise more often and in other species? Of course, you can ignore all of this if your magic system is an external factor, like being a gift from a god. But if you have an inheritable magic system, then I think this is something good to question because we rarely hear of other species in fantasy books that are able to perform magic. And I think it's highly unlikely that something so powerfully advantageous as magic would only happen in one species. It would more than likely actually arise in multiple instances. And it will also probably have arisen further back evolutionarily. So before humans branched off from chimpanzees and gorillas and every other primate species out there, so wouldn't you expect to see magic in more than just one species? One way to get around this is to say that the ability to perform magic evolved a long time ago, but there was a limiting factor preventing other species from being able to use the magic, like say, being able to create wands and use them or control over magical words which require language, which chimpanzees don't have. The basic idea is that you need to create a secondary constraint that your main race is able to work their way around, but others can't. But however you rationalize it, there is another point to be explored here. To start with, genetic inheritance of magic. Now, there are a lot of different ways that you can do this and which you pick will affect who inherits the magic. We'll talk about sex chromosomes, the XY ones in a moment, but let's go on to the rest of them for now. When an egg and a sperm come together, they each provide one copy of each chromosome, which then join up to make the pairs of chromosomes that we have. That's 23 in humans, 30 in giraffes, and who knows how many in elves. If magic is inherited, then the gene encoding for it might be on one of these chromosomes. So you could potentially end up with a copy coming from both mum and from dad. If you only need one copy from one parent for the offspring to be magical, then this is a dominant gene. If you need the gene to be present from both parents, then it's recessive. This means that if you have a dominant magic gene, then the chance of an offspring being magical depends on how many parents had the gene and how many copies of it they had. If one parent has only one copy of it themselves, then there is a 50-50 chance they will pass on. If they have two copies, then the magic will always be passed on to their offspring. If both parents have the magic, then more than likely their children will too. But if both parents only have one copy of the magic themselves, then there is a chance the offspring will be unlucky and won't inherit the magic gene from either. If your magic gene is recessive, however, then this gets a little bit more complicated. Where recessive magic is concerned, it's actually far more likely that an individual will be born without magic than with it. In fact, the only way to pretty much guarantee a magical offspring in that case is if both parents actually have the magic. But this is a great way of having a child inherit magic even when neither of the parents actually have magic themselves. To do this, you just need each parent to have come from a line where magic did happen and so has each of them a recessive copy of the magical gene that will occasionally spring up. Recessive genes like this do often spring up. In my family, we occasionally get ginger people and I'm quite sad that wasn't me. Gotta love that red hair. All right, 
Those were for the non-sex chromosome methods of inheriting magic, but there are some really interesting inheritance dynamics we can play about with if the magic gene is on a sex chromosome. Never thought I'd say that. We'll do it with dominant genes rather than recessive because it gets a bit messy where recessive is concerned with XY and I don't want to drag you too far down that rabbit hole. The sex chromosomes work because the father has an XY and the mother has two Xs. Sons inherit the Y from their father and one of the two Xs from their mother, while daughters get the X from their dad and one of the two Xs from their mum. So let's start with what happens if the magic is on the X chromosome. If the father has the magic gene on his X chromosome, so he is magic because this is a dominant gene, then any daughters he has will also have this magic gene, so will be magical, but his sons never will. If the mother has it, then this is a little bit more complicated. It all depends on if she inherited the magic from both her parents or just one of her parents. If both, then all the children she has will be magical. If just one, then there's a 50-50 chance either way, irrespective of the gender of the child. Things get even more complicated if both parents have magic, but what's important here is that the daughters would always be magical, but occasionally a son would be born who didn't have magic. Poor little guy. If the magic is on the Y chromosome, then it can only ever be passed from father to son. The daughters would never be magical, except for, in one instance, XY children who present as female. Intersex characters rarely get a look in when it comes to fantasy, and this could be a great way of incorporating them. In this instance, it would be Sawyer syndrome that would be causing the daughter to have magic. And the reason is because people with Sawyer syndrome have inherited the Y chromosome from their father, but externally they present as female. They have female genitalia, they don't go through puberty usually, so they're normally raised as daughters. And you could explore in this society what it means to be intersex. It would be particularly interesting because in this world people would potentially know that the daughter was intersex because she would have magical abilities that normally women can't have. And intersex isn't the only thing you can explore if you have magic on the Y chromosome. Because there's something really cool about the Y chromosome, maybe not cool isn't the right word, but it's degrading, it's accumulating damage over time, which is a really interesting concept to explore in terms of a magic system. Because if you have a male inherited magic system, then what would this mean? Is male magic growing a little bit more unstable with every passing generation? Could magic be on the verge of being wiped out? Has the Y chromosome become so varied that we actually see different types of magic in each family line being passed from father to son? That last one would be an almost foolproof method of paternity testing because, you know, you'd be able to tell if your lady had been stepping out on you because your son was doing a different type of magic unless she was cheating on you with your brother or father or uncle. I would love to see a world where someone did this and they actually mapped out all of the male magical powers as a phylogenetic tree of magic. I bet Darwin would have loved that too. But nuclear DNA isn't the only type of DNA in our bodies. Mm -mm. There are other ways of passing our DNA on. In our cells, we have an organelle that's called mitochondria. What they do isn't important for this video, so I'm sure I'll get to it at another one, but what you do need to know is that they have DNA of their own. That's right, a secondary DNA source in our cells that is separate from our nuclear DNA. The inheritance of mitochondrial DNA works differently from everything I've just told you about, so hold on to your hats. And this is because mitochondrial DNA is always passed down from the mother, never from the father. This is because the mitochondria are found inside the egg that the sperm penetrates into, and the sperm does have mitochondria of its own, but these decompose, so that means that every mitochondria inside of you came from the ones inside the egg that came from your mother. It's cool because if the mother was magical, then her children will be magical. In fact, any female offspring born from her line, so her daughter's daughter, her daughter's daughter's daughter, and so on, they will always be magical. Whereas her sons, they will be magical, but any children he has won't be unless he finds himself a magical lady of his very own. Now, why have I taken you on this biology crash course elaborately disguised as a fantasy video? Because even just by creating this video, my imagination was sparking with all of these ideas about the kinds of conflict that I could create by having a magic system in my society that was inheritable. Do magical men hope for daughters since they know that their daughters will be magical? Are non-magical men outcasts from society? 
This is the power of genetics right here. Just think of the cultural impacts of that sort of gender-based magic. Do people deliberately seek out partners to give their offspring magic? Is one gender feared or worshipped according to the magic they have? Do women hold more power in this type of culture, similar to what happened in The Power by Naomi Alderman? Now those were the genetic biggies, but there are some others that you can factor into your world that are also very cool. Epigenetics being a great one. This is the role that our environment plays in what our DNA does. So things like diet, exercise, and loads of other factors all alter the expression of our DNA meaning that you could arguably have situations where starvation in the early years of life could dampen or enhance someone's ability to be magical. And it's not just in terms of the individual's lifetime that you can consider here. There are consequences of the environment our parents and grandparents lived in, so there is a long-term impact to be thought of there. But leaving aside all of that, there is an even weirder type of magical inheritance that you could consider using in your world. Bacterial. We're absolutely covered in them, inside and out. And the composition is unique to each of us, but we often see them passed on, such as from a mother to baby, usually either through the birthing process or through the passing on of bacteria through milk. And that's actually a really important part of colonizing a baby's intestines with bacteria shortly after birth. What this means is that if you really wanted to, you could create a magic system whereby people could only perform the magic if they had a certain bacteria inside of them. You can pick the bacteria doing whatever you want it to do. You know, it's magic. It could be secreting a chemical that gives people the magical ability or digesting a protein that's found inside strawberries. So whenever someone eats a strawberry, they convert that into the protein they need to do magic. It's magic, do what you want. But the point is that we have a scientific basis to do this. So you can go crazy with that kind of thing. The point would be that no matter what the bacteria are, it would justify the presence of magic. So say you picked the path of it being transferred through breast milk, then you've got a lot of wet nurse dynamics to play with in your culture. The people might have figured out that there was something special about some people's breast milk, but maybe not what was special, but they knew something was going on. Now, I'm not personally going to do this in a story, but each author to their own book. As for the other one I mentioned, that of magic being passed on through the birth of the baby and the bacteria the baby is exposed to on the way out, then did someone figure out that children born through caesarean weren't magical? Again, I probably wouldn't write that story, but I am but here to give you options. And that is it for this week's video. I hope you enjoyed delving into all of the different ways that you can vary magical inheritance in your world and all of the different cultural effects that this might have. So how about you? Do you have a magic that is inherited in your world? If so, how are you doing it? Please someone say bacteria please let me know in the chat and don't forget to like and subscribe and have an absolutely fantastic week. Goodbye nerds.